Well, what is up, everybody? My name is Zach Tenner, and I am on the team here at Passion. We are thrilled that you came back for part two in our video series on how to study scripture. You see, in part one, my boy Jonathan came and crushed it, and he talked about the things we need to do when we first come into a new passage of scripture. And so a couple of the things he talked about was how the first thing you want to do is you want to come before God in prayer. You want to ask that he would open up your eyes to see in his word and that he would reveal things to you as you read. And how when you start first start reading, the first question you want to ask is, what do you see? What are the things you see in the text? And so before you hop into part two, you wanna make sure that you have seen and understood part one. And so the question we're gonna be asking right now is the second question, which is what does it mean? And so we're gonna jump right into James chapter one, verses 19 to 21. And the first few words that James says right off the bat is he says, know this, my beloved brothers. And so who's he talking to? He's talking to the beloved brothers. He's talking to the family of God. And so you may be watching this and you're wondering, man, how does someone get into the family of God? How does someone become a beloved brother or a beloved sister? And so there's actually a passage in 2 Corinthians that I love and Jesus, it's talking about him and how he is full of righteousness and how ultimately we are full of sin. But when Jesus comes and he lives a perfect life, dies on the cross and ultimately rises from the grave, then there is a point where uh, if we put our faith and trust in him, then he takes his righteousness and he gives it to us and we take our sin and he has taken it and paid for it on the cross. A lot of people have referred to it as the great exchange. And when that happens and when you put your faith in Jesus, then you ultimately get to be a part of the family. And you are one of the beloved brothers and sisters that James is talking to. And so he talks to them and he says, you need to know this. He says, there's something you need to know. And so if I see you on the street and I tell you, hey, there's something you need to know, there's something you need to understand, you need to know this, then you're going to be laser focused on the next thing that I say. And so when James says, know this, my beloved brothers, then the rest of the text is what he wants us to know. And so he says this, he says, let every person be quick to hear. He says, you want to be slow to speak and you want to be slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And so ultimately what we're running after, ultimately what we're chasing after is the righteousness of God. That's what we want to be produced in us. But he's saying there's some things that kind of get in the way of that. And what gets in the way is when we are not quick to hear, when we're not slow to speak, and when we're not slow to anger. But that's hard, isn't it? Like I know the time that my mouth oftentimes gets me in trouble is when I am not slow to speak, but rather I'm quick to speak. And what I love about this passage is that uh, we can understand it for ourselves, but ultimately this was written to a specific group of people. And later on, like we can talk a little bit more about that. But uh, when I think about this passage and when I think about this text, it's written to Jewish Christians. And so what is entailed with that is that when they were Jewish, they have these Jewish family members and uh, these Jewish friends who didn't like the fact that they were Christians. And their Christian people didn't necessarily know how to think about the fact that they were Jewish. And so how that ultimately played out is that they had a lot of people in their life who seemed to be attacking them on different sides. And James, even knowing that, says that you still need to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Why? Because the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And we want the righteousness of God to be produced in our lives. And so right after that, the very next word is the word therefore. And so you may have heard the old adage, when you see the word therefore, you wanna know what is it there for? And so it's there to link the previous sentence with the next sentence that's about to come. And so he says, therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And so there's ultimately, uh, it says that the implanted word is what we want to receive. But he says, before we do that, man, there's this filthiness and this wickedness that we ultimately need to put away. And when I hear that word filthiness, it takes me back to the high school football locker room. And I remember that uh, sanitation and cleanliness was not at the top of the priority list when it came to that locker room. And there are ultimately jerseys and gloves and cleats and even socks and all these different things that may not get washed a ton throughout the course of the season. And to be honest with you, it's a pretty filthy place. 
and it wasn't something that you probably wanted to be a part of, but we still put on these filthy things and we went out and practiced or did whatever, played the game. And ultimately we, we wore these filthy things. And it's funny because now that I'm older, I'm 27 and I, I can look back and be like, there's no way I would ever put that filthy stuff on me again. And similarly, I think James is trying to say, hey, that, that filthiness and that wickedness in your life, man, put that away. You don't even want that to be a part of who you are. Put that away because ultimately there's something I need you to receive and that's going to block you from receiving it. And what we need to receive is the implanted word. He says we need to receive that with meekness because that word has the ability to save our souls. And so you may wonder, what is that word? What is it talking about when it says the word? Well, in John chapter one, verse one, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You see the word oftentimes is a metaphor for Jesus and this text is pointing to Jesus. And the word, which is the Bible, ultimately in its totality points to Jesus Christ and he has the power to save our souls. Well, there's some resources that I would love to share with you guys. One of them is that I love to use a study Bible. And what a study Bible has is that it will have a lot of the background information like I talked about earlier. And so it can give you some information about what it was like for the people who received the letters or the people who received the books and can give you information on some of the things they were walking through. And that can help give you uh, even more of a context for what it was like for them. Or maybe you have a seasoned leader who can try to help you walk through what it means to be able to see the word of God for what it is. And maybe they've been reading it for a long time and they can help you see more of the beauty that comes when you read the word of God. And so we're so glad you guys joined us for part two and we are pumped for part three where we're gonna come around the question of what do you do? And so that is going to be an incredible resource and we can't wait for you guys to be able to see that. Thanks for watching.